All right, so did you guys notice that I have a table up here? Anyone notice this? All right, so we've got a glass top table, and I'm just curious how many of you have ever owned a glass top table? Maybe you currently own. It doesn't have to look like this. It could be like a coffee table. It could be an end table. So I'm like, you guys just raise your hand real quick one more time. So for those of you who have owned a glass top table, do you treat it differently than your other tables in the sense that there's like a, okay, I don't know how much weight it can take. And so you would normally just like throw stuff on a normal table. You'd put heavy things. But when it comes to a glass top, you're just like slightly more paranoid. Anyone? Okay, so me too, and I think that the individual who we're gonna watch in this next video probably should have had that same paranoia. Let's watch. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. 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 All right, so how many of you, when you watch this, you're like, well, buddy, what'd you think was gonna happen? Like, anyone, like, this guy's crazy if he thinks that's not gonna happen at some point. Uh, we're, we're in this series entitled uh, How to Find, uh, sorry, we're, it's actually entitled, this is the fifth week, I should know it by now. The title of this series is A Biblical Path Towards Mental Health. And in this series, what we are looking at is how we can actually look at God's word so that we can encounter different spaces and places mentally that sometimes we struggle, right? In this series, we've looked at anxiety, we've looked at depression, we've explored how oftentimes we just listen to that shark music, uh, the negativity, the fear just kind of creeps in. Last week, we talked about trauma. This week, where we have we're going to be talking about how to avoid the breaking point. We're, we're going to talk about how we can avoid the breaking point. Maybe another way to say that would be, how can we avoid burnout? How can we avoid burnout? Now, um, for those of you who uh, have heard that phrase, burnout, before, um, I, think, I think it's easy for most of us to kind of look at our lives and realize there's, there's stuff that we've got in it, and it's heavy and oftentimes really burdensome, and so how can we avoid that point where where you just start to crack a little bit. There was a study that was done in 2021 of uh, Amer the American workforce. And what they did is they interviewed and they surveyed uh, like thousands of different people. And what they found is that over 50% of the workforce is feeling a sense of burnout in their place of employment, either due to high levels of stress, uh, whether uh, due to, you know, post-COVID type of stuff, uh, or just all the extra demands that people have on. Over half of the people in the United States, just from work alone, are experiencing burnout. You know what that means? That means many of you probably are experiencing the breaking point. Some of you are experiencing that burnout because it's not just a work thing. Like a lot of people think, oh yeah, no, yeah, work is really stressful. I'm working these crazy hours. Burnout's usually a combination of a lot of things. So if you've already got it in your work environment, there's probably other spaces too where you just got a lot of weight. Um, I'll give you kind of a, a working definition of uh, burnout, the breaking point. Um, if you would, just go ahead and look at it on the screen behind me. But what is burnout? Burnout is a combination of mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion from multiple sources and complicated situations. Multiple, right? It's a combination. I think most of you probably have a decent track record of working and working well. I think probably most of you have a decent track record of taking care of yourself probably taking care of other people that you're supposed to be taking care of. You've got a decent track record when it comes to um, making sure that you're serving and also at the same time finding time for rest. Like most of us have a pretty good track record, but what oftentimes ends up happening is, you know, one year, uh, you just add a little bit more to your life. And I know some of you are thinking, is he gonna break that table? My wife told me you're not allowed to break that table. So this table is not getting broken, but it is gonna be our visual here. So you take on a little bit this year, and then next year rolls around, and what do you do? You decide to take on a little bit more. And you're fine, you're good. I don't know if you were paying attention, probably not, but there were 17 bricks, 17 bricks on that poor kid's table, and it was just fine. Until number what? 18, and then things started to crack. And that's what oftentimes happens in our lives. You take on a little bit more one year, and then you take on a little bit more the next year, and you take on a little bit more the year after that, and at some point you reach your breaking point. For many of you, the breaking point is starting to, to take place because you've just been trying to manage 
everybody's expectations. And you keep saying yes to things, and you keep saying, I've got it, no problem, and you don't ask for help, and you don't, you're not vulnerable with other people and say, hey, I, I really like a little bit of a assistance, because you want to make sure that you got it all taken care of. And maybe you're reaching your breaking point because, well, it's a little bit of that, and it's also the news that your, your folks, they're getting a little older, and now they need you to take care of them. And you're feeling the weight of that as well. And then, you know, maybe it's a health crisis in your own life. The doctor said, you're, you're really going to have to go through some treatments. And these treatments are going to be difficult and they're going to be challenging. And then on top of that, your work says, oh, you know what? Actually, uh, we're going to have to cut your hours. And you're already kind of tight financially. And now you're really tight. And what ends up happening is you get enough of these bricks and you begin to experience cracks and things begin to be so heavy that you reach your breaking point and you're in trouble. Now, how many of you have ever broken a bone before? Anyone ever broken a bone? Okay, all right. So if you've broken a bone, um, how many of you had a cool story to go along with it? You guys have a cool story? Yeah, it's always good when you have a cool story. Most people expect a cool story, right? In fact, I would say when you're younger, like when you break a bone, there is a cool factor. Like you walk into your, your classroom and you've got like a cast and it was like, oh my gosh, let me sign your cast. What's the story? How'd that happen? Right? And you get to share the story and it's, it's almost cool when you break a bone. I, I, I broke multiple bones in my life. One happened when I was in high school. I broke my leg and I wish, like everyone has assumed that I had a cool story. I came hobbling in on crutches and they're like, oh man, what happened? And they thought, oh, this is like this epic skateboard accident. Like, was it, were you playing sports? You know? No, it was like the dumbest thing ever. I was standing on a picnic bench. My buddy was standing below me. I'm a sophomore in high school. And if you remember yourself when you were a sophomore, you just, you think stupid things. And so I, I thought it would be really hilarious just to like jump on my friend. I know, right? That's just dumb. Like, why would I, why would I think that? So I jump and like mid jump, I'm thinking, why would I do this? Like he's, his back isn't even facing me. Like I, it would be one thing, like I jump on his back, like, ah, horsing around, but I'm going to be like jumping, like Face first, like what is this? Like what, I'm face first? Like what am I kissing? I don't even know what's going on in my head. So I jump and I realize I need to bail on this idea. And so I bail on the idea and just land really awkwardly on my leg. And guess what? It was broken. And that's the story of my broken leg. And the only reason it's kind of cool is you guys can all laugh at how dumb I was, right? When I was in high school. Here's the thing. When you break a leg, when you break an arm, when you break a bone, People have some empathy, right? They've got, they've got a level of understanding and maybe it's even a cool story, but you break emotionally, you break on a psychological level and there's stigma attached to that. And I hate to say it, but I think oftentimes even in spaces like this, like Christian spaces, sometimes it's even worse because there's this, there's a thought of, well, aren't, aren't, isn't he a Christian? Like, aren't you walking with the Lord? Like, aren't you praying anymore? Like, aren't you reading his, his word and allowing it to transform your heart and your mind? And there's a stigma oftentimes attached to it. So let me just encourage you. If you've reached the breaking point, if you have experienced burnout, let me just tell you, like, you don't have to worry about your salvation, okay? Right? All that means is you probably need to have a course correction. And just so we can kind of feel good about ourselves, honest answers here, how many of you this past week you are a little stressed out about something on some level, a little bit of stress. Help me out here, be honest. Anyone experience some stress? Okay, some of you, some of you are like so anti, raise your hand. I could say, do you want a million dollars? And you'd be like, no, I am not raising my hand for a million. I, I'm sure most of you have experienced some stress this week. How about this one though? Have you guys ever experienced the breaking point? Like and maybe not last week, but maybe last week. Ever experienced that, that point where you're just like, I am so done, I'm so over it. There, there was just this emotional, almost deadness. You ever been there? Show of hands. Right? It, it happens, guys. And, and, and it's one of those things that what we're going to be talking about today is, is not that anything's wrong with you. You simply probably need to make a course correction. You've made some mistakes, and now you need to make a course correction. And the reality is that... Um, 
we need to diagnose, I think, just to make sure that this is helpful for us, we need to diagnose the difference between stress and, and burnout, because there is a difference. They, they definitely work together, and, and certainly one causes uh, the other, but what is stress? We've got a, kind of a definition of what this oftentimes looks like. It's generally short-lived and is related to a temporary project, event, or challenge. So it's the, I've got a presentation tomorrow. And I do not like 100 eyes looking at me, all you know, hanging on my every word. I'm so stressed out about that experience. It's the, I've got a test on Wednesday, and I'm so unprepared for that. It's the, I, I've just encountered this, this move, and I'm not really finding myself fitting in quite yet. Maybe it, you had your kitchen remodeled, and there's people in and out. And it's like, I don't have my own space. Like, the contractors are always calling, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Like, that's, that's, that can be stressful. But what do we know? We know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. We know that it's probably not going to be your favorite season. Oh, good, I get to remodel my house, and weird people are in there. Oh, good, I get to make this presentation in front of, you know, 200 people. It may not be your favorite event, but you know as long as you can get through Tuesday, like Wednesday will be a little easier, and so it's like, okay, okay, just got to push through. Whereas burnout's a little different. When you experience burnout, burnout is chronic stress that feels never-ending. It feels like it's never going to get better. I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I, I, I'm feeling emotionally drained. It's never, it's never going to be better. We're never going to get out of this space. It, I might as well just give up, right? It's that, that, that almost that dead feeling inside, a numbness that takes place. And if you've ever experienced that, you, again, are in good company because individuals in Scripture experience that as well. Uh, we're going to look at the life of a man of God, a prophet of God, who is probably the poster child to everything we've been talking about in the series. Did he experience anxiety? Yep. Was he depressed? Big time. Did he experience trauma? Was he listening to shark music way more than he should have? Yep. Who is this person? Any guesses? It's the prophet. Nailed it. Who said it? Was that Karen? No, no. Okay. That was, who was that? Suzanne? Well done. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah, if you don't know this prophet, he was, let me give you kind of his spiritual resume. Um, Jeremiah was an individual who was called by God to speak against a king named Ahab. Uh, Ahab is a king in the northern kingdom of Israel, and he was wicked. Uh, he uh, was practicing idolatry. He was leading the Israelites into this idolatry. He cheated, he lied, he murdered, and Elijah had the job of telling him that God was not pleased with him. Imagine, that's, that's kind of heavy responsibility. On top of that, he's told that he needs to tell um, the king that there's going to be a drought for three years in the land. So major famine, people are going to have a hard time even getting you know, nourishment for, uh, for themselves for years. And so he shares this with Ahab. Ahab's not happy about it. And so he sends his men to go ahead and find uh, Elijah, hopefully to change it, maybe to kill him just because he's been running his mouth too long. And Elijah has to run and he has to hide. Uh, God takes care of him. He, he, he nourishes him through uh, even the feeding of uh, birds coming with bread and, and meat, uh, the ravens, maybe you've heard that. He was able to minister to a widow and her son. Uh, that son actually dies, and now he's in, you know, like, what, what? You call me to minister to these people, and they were ministering to me, and now he died, what? what? He's able to actually raise this child from the dead. Uh, later on, he faces down 850 prophets of Baal, this false god, 850 men who would love nothing more than to kill Elijah. And then after, you know, he faces down these prophets, he prays, and this firebolt uh, comes from, from heaven, and it consumes the altar. Really amazing stuff. But you know what each one of those things are? Each one of them is a brick, right? You got this responsibility, go to Ahab, the king. Really? I got to go to the king? Okay, I can take this. And, and then, wait, wait, I have to run for my life? And it becomes this huge weight. I was talking um, randomly, my, my son Davis asked me this, this past week, he's like, hey, who's your favorite, favorite uh, your prophet? I was like, favorite prophet? He's like, mine's Elijah. I was like, oh, really, why? And he names all these reasons. Then he named like five or ten others. He's like, oh, man, Elijah's so awesome. But each time we look at Elijah's life, it's just one more brick, one more responsibility. There's, there's one more expectation that God and, and someone else has on him, and it becomes this, this weight 
to the point where he experiences the 18th brick. Like he was good, he was good with the 17th, but then when the 18th lands on his life, he reaches his breaking point. He experiences burnout. What was his breaking point? What was that 18th brick? Well, it came from a woman, a woman named Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, who basically says, dear, if you can't take care of this pesky prophet, then I'm going to take care of him for you. And she sends a message to Elijah and says, hey, guess what? By this time, tomorrow, you're dead. You are a dead man. And Elijah reaches his breaking point. Could he have handled it? Could he have handled it if it was only that one? Like that was the first one? That was the only threat? Yeah, probably. But he had all these things that were stacked on his life. And then when that one hit, it was like, it's too much. I can't handle it anymore. And he stepped into this feeling, this sense of despair. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Kings. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19 the rest of the day. We're going to start reading in verse 3. And it's here that we see Elijah's breaking point. It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Elijah was what? He was afraid. And this is a tool that our enemy uses quite often. Loves to use fear to keep us from seeing the goodness and the hope that God has for our lives. Right? This is the, I, I've switched between being just stressed out, but I still have hope, to there is no hope. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed. Okay, so again, prophet of God, man of God, and he's sitting down under some shade, and he is going to pray and talk to God. This is going to be a great epic prayer, right? This is going to be the, Lord, uh, you've been with me for all my life. You are clearly still with me. You're still protecting me. I know you're with me now, and you will forever be with me. Like, that's going to be the prayer, isn't it? Not exactly. He prays that he might die. He says, this is what he says, the, the prayer itself. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Kill me now, God. Kill me now. Can the prophet of God talk to God like that? Like, can a man of God... Can a woman of God actually talk to God like that? Maybe some of you have actually talked to God that way. Maybe that has been your prayer at some point in your life. Maybe it wasn't a prayer. Maybe it was just a thought that you had. And then it appears as though Elijah just completely gives up. Then he lay down under the bush and he quits. He falls asleep. He's done. Ever been there? Just totally exhausted? Completely done? That's where Elijah's at. And what we see is really three mistakes that Elijah makes that probably led to this breaking point. And it's three mistakes that Elijah makes, and it's three mistakes that I think many of us make that cause us to get to the breaking point. We're going to look at these three mistakes, but then we're going to look at two ways that he and we can actually make a course correction. But first mistake that we oftentimes make is that we run ourselves into the ground. We run ourselves into the ground. Now, Elijah literally runs himself to the point of exhaustion. Just to kind of give you an idea of how much running he does, we've got a map here. So if you've been following the story of Elijah, he is on Mount Carmel. He has this encounter with those 850 prophets of Baal. And then shortly after this, Jezebel says, you're a dead man. I'm coming to get you. And so he runs from this area in the north all the way down south to Beersheba. And then we're going to see a little bit later, he continues to go even further. This is over 100 miles. This is over 100 miles that he is running. How many of you have ever ran a marathon before? Anyone? We've got one marathon runner. How many of you would not dream in your wildest dreams of ever running a marathon? Anyone? Okay, yes, because it's intense. And it was intense, am I right? Lots of training, the day after, probably sore, kind of done with it. This is the equivalent of about four marathons. Four marathons that Elijah runs to get away from Jezebel. This would be the equivalent of sprinting down to Louisville and back again. This would be like, hey, let's do a quick power walk to Cincinnati. I mean, that's pretty intense. And by the time he's there, he's done. He is exhausted physically. And we do the same thing, right? We do the same thing as maybe a student. Maybe you've been there as a student. It's the, okay, I want, I want to get really great grades, and it's not enough just to get like the, the, the A's and B's. I got to get straight A's. 
and I'm going to work hard for those straight A's. And that would, that would, that would be like one brick, but then you want to add another brick in. I want, to make, I want to make sure that I'm really making it worth it by taking the hardest classes. Give me the AP classes, and I'm going to be top of the class. And it's not enough just to be focused on your studies. You also have to work 20 hours because you got things you got to pay for, and you're saving up for this, and you're saving up for that. And, okay, those two bricks, that, that might be manageable, but then you go and add another one, you decide, I've got to be involved in that sport, and I can't just be on the team, I've got to be a starter every single time, and I really like playing that instrument, I love being a part of that club, and of course, there's church and there's ministry, and so I've got to be involved in those things too, and what ends up happening? At some point, you probably will reach your breaking point. You, you will run yourself to the ground, or you've got to be the perfect parent. Right? Got to be the perfect mom. Got to be the perfect dad. It's not enough just to take care of them. It's not enough just to, to make sure that they're spiritually being nourished. Like, you got to compete with all the other parents. Oh, wait, wait, that's the clothes that everyone's wearing? Oh, that's the new gadget? Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to, right? Or, or maybe it's at work. <clears throat> Have you ever been that, that person that wants to be the go-to guy, go-to girl? Oh, no one else is accepting that responsibility? I know, I'm not actually getting paid for it. It's not a part of my job description, but I'll take it on. I already got a thousand other things, but I'll take this one on too. At some point, what ends up happening is we get wore out, and it leads to the breaking point. The second mistake that we oftentimes make is going to flip to the next side. We try to do it all on our own. Certainly, this was one of Elijah's mistake, and it's certainly one of ours too. Uh, we, we keep people at arm's length. We want to, it, it's all about um, image management. We, we can handle it. We can do it. We don't need people help, helping. And, and because of, we're all about the image management, we don't let people in to actually support and encourage. Elijah, how does he do it? He finds himself actually leaving his friend, his servant, in Beersheba while he travels on ahead. What does he do? He leaves, he leaves his right-hand man? Like his wing man? The individual who is probably not just a servant who takes care of his needs, but is probably an emotional confidant? Why does he do it? Why does he leave me behind? We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us why. Maybe he was doing the spiritual thing. Ah, it's just me and God. Like, we'll take care of it. Me and God will take care of it. Maybe he was just prideful. It was the, hey, you know what? Uh, I don't want anyone to see me like this. You stay here while I go have my moment. You ever been there? I don't want anyone to see me like this. I'm weak. I'm vulnerable. You just stay away. We keep people at arm's length. Uh, maybe, maybe it was one of those things that he was trying to be noble. You know, like, hey, if someone's going to die here, it's just going to be me, not going to be you. We don't know why he leaves his friend behind, but we do know that it ends up doing a lot of damage. He, he, he gets to the breaking point because of it. Um, oftentimes, when we step into a church community like this, it's fine when we're fine. But as soon as we're not fine, you ever just kind of want to walk away from it? Why is that? As the enemy loves to see you separated from a community of strength, hope, and joy. That's a, that's a real quick way to lead to your breaking point. I was reading an article about hot black coffee. You guys know that it's a, a chain restaurant, cafe. You guys ever heard of hot black? I hadn't either until I read the article. But one of their core values is the health and vitality of their customer. Like, they want health and vitality in their customer. And so one of the things that they have chosen not to do is actually offer free Wi-Fi to, their, uh, to individuals who come and, and, and uh, study there, um, get their coffee. And a lot of people have kind of given them criticism, like, what? No, I, I wanted my computer, and I want free Wi-Fi. And they say, no, that's not one of our core values. I'm like, what do you mean it's not one of your core values? Yet we, we know, science has told us for decades, that social interaction... Like one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with people is actually really, really healthy. And it's not healthy to always be on a screen, so we're not going to offer that to you guys. Isn't that good? I, I mean, how many, how many of us need a reminder that it's the social connection, it's the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus. You need each other, community, right? You need connection, not just to put up the walls of protection. One of the third uh, mistakes that Elijah ends up making, you can go to the next slide, and we also make, is we tend to dwell on the negative. We tend to dwell on the negative. Now, we, we talked about shark music a few weeks ago, but this is the, everything's going pretty good, <laughs> but they got a couple things that you just, you just, we just dial in on and we can't see any of the other good. This is the, okay, um, 
What's his prayer? Like, Lord, um, I'm no better than my ancestors. That, that's the prayer. I, I, I'm no better than anyone else who's come before me. I thought I was going to do better, but I'm not. I'm failing. I, I'm just I'm a total loser. And he, and he throws up his hands, and he gives up. I think we can do this oftentimes when it comes to comparing ourselves to other people. I mean, we, we don't like to admit it, but how many of us, we kind of glance through the people next to us and say, oh, they are killing it when it comes to their family. Oh, I will never, I will never have a relationship with my kids like they ever, but I wish I could. Oh, it'll never happen. I wish I was just married. I'll never be married. I, I, it worked out once, but like, it blew up, and I'm probably never going to get married again. I'm not, not like them. They're just so wonderful. And we compare ourselves to all these other people, and what ends up happening is we move from the, okay, yeah, I've got a challenge. I'm a little stressed out about the challenge to uh, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. All that is is the same pattern. It's going to be the same mistakes over and over again. It's going to be the same dead ends over again. I, I, can't, I can't go. It's just too negative. And you just keep going negative. And you keep going negative, And you move from, yeah, it's a little stressful. It's, it's a little uncomfortable to burnout. You reach your breaking point. So what do we do? The question then is, can we move from those breaking point moments and make a course correction for some healing? And the answer, I think, is yes, because we see it in Elijah's life, and we've seen it in Christians' lives for hundreds of years. How does it happen for Elijah? Well, God sends an angel. <laughs> and I know some of you are like, that sounds awesome. So the next time I'm at my breaking point, God, send me an angel. I'll take that. Send me an angel. Well, is it possible? Is it possible that you are here today because God's got a word for you? Is it possible that right here in this space, God wants to give you the encouragement, maybe through your brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe through the reading of God's word? And in no way am I trying to tell you, and I'm the angel, like he sent me, I'm the angel. Like, that's not what I'm trying to communicate. I'm not, I'm not Clarence, you know, jumping into the river or trying to say, that, that's not me, but, but it's possible. It's possible by the reading of God's word that he's got a word for you. So what is this encounter with the angel? Look at the middle of verse five. It says, all at once, an angel touched him and said, let me tell you what he does not say. Like, it's not a, all of a sudden he got this kick from an angel, wake up, you idiot. Boy, you still hanging out underneath the broom you know, bush? You still running and crying because that, that creepy little girl went boo and you got really scared? Yeah, you loser. I mean, get up already. Right? That's, not, that's not what the angel says. Instead, it says, get up and eat. Elijah, what does he do? He looks around, and there by, the head, by his head was bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. He says, Hey, get up. Now that you've got a little bit of rest, I've got a snack for you. Like, enjoy this protein bar. It's going to be delicious, and you need it. And get this, why does he need it? He says, because the journey, it's not over. God's not done with you. I know you feel like he's done with you, and you feel like giving up, but he's not done with you. So rest, rejuvenate, because he's still got stuff for you to do. You know, for us, the course correction might just need to be rest and being refueled. We need rest, and we need to be refueled. What can that look like? Any number of things. Maybe for you, it's, it's a break. You, you just need to break your day up and get out of the negativity. And so maybe once or twice a day, you just stop and you just decide to be still and know that he's God. Maybe just for one minute, you just stop, be still, and have that break of, okay, I need to center my heart and my life on him. Maybe for you, you need that, but you also need some genuine rest. What you need to do is one day out of the week, you just remove two of these. As best you can, you just need to remove two of these and say, okay, today I'm just going to, my goal is to get a solid eight hours of sleep for the first time in like nine months. Like that's, that's what I'm going to do because you, you genuinely need, you need some rest. But for others of you, you know it's more than just a nap because if it was as easy as a nap and it wasn't like this needing rest for your soul, like you would have figured that out like last weekend when you crashed for two hours Sunday afternoon, right? That it would have worked out. But you need to be refueled. And the experts tell us that there's a few ways that you can refuel yourself. And it's going to sound really counterintuitive, but one of the ways is actually to add something to your life. 
And you're thinking, wait, I thought we were taking bricks off so that we wouldn't experience the breaking point. I know, I get it. But you need to actually add something that brings fuel and vitality to you. I know of a pastor who, um, he reached the breaking point, and when he did, he was sitting down with a counselor, therapist, and the therapist asked him, hey, what, uh, what do you do for fun? Like, what, what is your hobby? What do you do? You know, do enjoy? He's like, I work, I work, and I work, and I work, and I work. It's like, okay, yeah, I get it, but what do you, what do, you do like, to relax? Relax? What are you talking about? Counselor kind of had to go a different direction. Say, okay, at some point in your life, what did you do as a hobby? And he thought, and he's like, well, when I was in high school, I kind of enjoyed sailing every once in a while. So like, you need to pick up sailing. What? What are you talking about? I got way too many things. I, I, can't, I can't sail and also do all the other. No, 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 you can't afford not to pick up sailing. And so we started sailing. And he found while he was, you know, hosting up the, you know, the jib or whatever they got going on on the boat, uh, what he found was, is his mind, which would never shut down. Like, you, you got one of those jobs? You got one of those jobs where you constantly have to be thinking, you have to be innovating, you have to constantly be problem solving, you're going, 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 and you can't turn that thing off, you can't shut it off, and you wake up in the middle of the night, and it's still going, going, going. What he found was that when he was doing the physical activity, his brain shut down, and he began to be refueled with this activity. No, another pastor, exact same thing, reached his breaking point. And instead of sailing, he decided to do MMA, mixed martial arts. And while he's getting tossed and while he's tossing dudes, guess what? His brain turns off and he's able to be fueled by that event, by that activity. Now, some of you are like, dude, I, I'm a construction worker. Like, I am constantly working. I am a, a stay-at-home parent. I am running and I am exhausted physically. Okay, for, for you, it's the opposite. The experts say what you need to do is you need to disengage physically and engage mentally. Stay-at-home parents, that might be carving out an hour where you're sitting down and having an adult conversation once a week with somebody to be refueled. For others of you, it might be an engaging hobby where your, your mind is being challenged. It's a, it's a podcast. It's a book. It, it could be any number of things. If you're thinking to yourself, I have no idea what that could be in my life then think back about what maybe was something that fueled you in your past, which is no longer a part of your life. And when you think about that, oh yeah, no, I really did enjoy that. And when I would, I'd walk away, oh, that was really, that's it, that's it. That's how you can begin to be refueled. The third, or sorry, the second course correction that Elijah makes and that we need to make too is you and I, we need to have a regular encounter with a holy God. You want to avoid burnout, you want to avoid the breaking point, you need an encounter with the Holy God. How does this play itself out in the life of Elijah? Turn with me to verse 11. It says, the Lord said, this is after even a further journey, so even after uh, he, he gets to Beersheba, he continues on to this mountain called Horab. It says, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came, a fire came, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came, a gentle whisper. Did you guys notice that God was not in the extraordinary? He was in the ordinary? Ever been there? Ever been in those moments where it's, it's life is heavy and you feel like you're breaking and all you're doing is changing a dirty diaper and you're like, oh, why right now? Does he have a blowout, right? And then there's this sense of, and you just reflect on God just for a second and he shows up in a whisper. He, he just whispers his encouragement in your life. Maybe you're having something in you know, your, your workplace, and you plop yourself down at your desk, and you're just so frustrated, and you're so angry, and you're about to give it up, and you just walk away from it all, and you're just like, <sighs> and God shows up in a whisper, and he speaks that word of encouragement that you need. Why does God oftentimes communicate in a whisper? Is it possible it's because he's never far away? He's never far away, and so he doesn't need to scream. He doesn't need to shout. He just needs to speak your name. But we have to actually be listening. And we have to have those pauses. We have to have those breaks in order to have that encounter with the holy God. Verse 13, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Where was Elijah? He was in the, he was in what? 
cave, dark cave. But the voice of God drew him out. Some of you, you are in the darkness of despair, and God is wanting to draw you out with a whisper. What I want to do is a little exercise, and whenever something's new, you know, it's a little scary. This is not going to be scary. I think this will be very beneficial, but I want everybody to participate in it. Uh, so if you've got something on your lap, if you're holding something in your hand, go ahead and set that aside. And what I want everybody to do, even if you're online, unless you're driving, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to put your, your hands on your knees, on your legs, on your thighs, wherever it's comfortable. And I want you to kind of sit with your arms there in a comfortable position, okay? And I want everybody to close their eyes and not fall asleep. Like, that's the challenging part, right? So everybody close your eyes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk us through a, what is oftentimes referred to as a visual prayer. So everybody go ahead and close your eyes. And I want you to imagine that you are in a cave. I want you to imagine that it's dark and you are alone. And I want you to imagine that you have a backpack that is on your shoulders. And inside that backpack, you are carrying all the burdens of your life, all the things that are stressing you out, all the things that are breaking you. And I want you to visualize that they are in the form of bricks. And I want you to feel the weight on your shoulders, how it's just pressing into your muscles, how it's compressing on your back. I want you to experience the, the weight of that backpack. And now, again, with your eyes still closed, I want you to imagine that you hear your name spoken outside the cave. And you listen, and you hear your name spoken a second time, but this time you hear an invitation. Come stand with me. And so with the heavy weight of your backpack, you, you go and stand up. And you begin to walk outside of the darkness, the loneliness of that cave. And I want you to imagine that your eyes are trying to adjust to the light. And you can't really see who's communicating. But you know someone's there. And as the eye, your eyes begin to adjust to the light, you see the kind and gentle face of Jesus. And he walks over to you. And he asks to carry the backpack. And I want you to imagine now that you slip it off of your shoulders and he places it on his shoulders. And as you're standing there, I want you to, to kind of just feel the, the weight being lifted. And for just a moment, what I want you to do is I want you to talk to him about what's in the backpack. For just a moment, I want you to go ahead and just name some of the things that you're carrying. Too many responsibilities all those expectations that are so unmanageable, your fears about the future. I want you to think through and, and, and talk about the, the hurts that maybe you're holding on to. And what I'd like you to do now is, again, in the silence of your own heart, what I want you to do is turn to Jesus and look deep in his eyes and just speak the words, Jesus, I surrender. And just kind of participating in what maybe the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart and in your life right now. I would encourage you to go a step further in, in what you're doing. Keep your eyes closed, but this time, what I would like you to do is take your palms, take your hands, and I want you to turn them upward. I want you to go in and take a deep breath. Blow out silently. I'm going to have you do that one more time, and what I'd like you to do this time is, with those burdens all the things that you're carrying, what I want you to do is take a deep breath, blow out, and this time say, Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all to you. Take a deep breath. Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all to you. Amen. Amen.